Welcome to Wesley Theological Seminary and our November topic for Second Mondays. We're glad to have Mike's not saying enough. Yes, exactly. Kristen, would you like to pray for us this morning? Let us pray. Lord, fill us with transition. Lord, this is also a season of change for our government. New leaders will fill positions to lead our nation. In this time of transition, be with those men and women who help make decisions that help other people's lives. Lord, as we enter a season patience when we do not see the blessings. Allow us to find you in all things this season. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm Laura Norvell. I'm the Vice President for Development here at Wesley Theological Seminary. It is good to be with you all this morning. I have the pleasure this morning of introducing our speaker. Mike's pedigree. Mike McCurry is co-director of the National Capital Seminar for Seminarians and now a distinguished professor of public theology here at Wesley Theological <coughs> Seminary. He's a veteran political strategist and spokesperson with over 35 years of experience in Washington, D.C. He served as White House Press Secretary to President Clinton from 95 to 98. He also served as spokesperson for the Department of State and Director of Communications for the Democratic National Committee. He's held a variety of leadership roles for national campaigns on the Democratic ticket from 84 to 2004 and worked as press secretary in the United States Senate from 1976 to 1983. He is also an active lay leader in his local congregation, which is St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Kensington, Maryland. He joined the Wesley Board of Governors in 2000 and is now a distinguished and emeriti governor with us. He been, while he was a governor, he began taking classes and uh, exploring the, the role of the relationship between Christian ethics and politics. He served on numerous boards or advisory councils, including Share Our Strength, the Junior Statesman Foundation, the Children's Scholarship Fund, the White House Historical Association, the Global Health Initiative of the United Methodist Church. He's the coach. And a Master of Arts in Liberal Studies from Georgetown in 1985. We are proud, too, to call him a graduate of Wesley Theological Seminary, having received one of the first newly designed Master of Arts degrees from Wesley in May of 2013. Today he's joining us to speak about how election 2014 treats the least and the lost. We're glad, glad you'd be with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Laura, thank you for that introduction. Uh, <coughs> she spared you all of the, the part of that pedigree includes the historic figures that I know you know well because you're also learned. You remember, of course, the administration of President John Glenn, <laughs> Pres <laughs> President Bruce Babbitt, <laughs> President Mike Dukakis, <laughs> President Bob Kerry, <laughs> President John Kerry. <laughs> None of this is not ringing a bell with you? <laughs> I even at one point, uh, there's a great outfit called the National Democratic Institute, and they sent me to Poland, and I consulted with a guy named Mazowiecki who ran against Lech Walesa for president of Poland, thereby 
Establishing that your speaker here at Second Monday is not only a loser, but an international world-class loser <laughs> when it comes to the question of politics. So <clears throat> what wisdom I will impart to you based on that checkered history uh, remains in some doubt, but it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you here today and a little intimidating for me because I was in this very classroom so often sitting out where you're sitting now as a student and to be here and standing at the podium and trying to think of uh, enlightening things to say is a little bit intimidating. But um, we will have at it a little bit and I will uh, go through some things that I think are important to understand about the role that religion and politics play together as they intertwine in our political culture. And I want to talk about that to set a premise before we actually get to the down and dirty stuff, which is to talk about the most recent uh, campaign. But I kind of start with, and, and by the way, there was a little outline up here, so if any of you don't have that, you may want to grab that. Politics. So here we are, polite together, talking about both at once and the first temptation is to say when you're in the aftermath of an election like the one we just had is thank God it's over <laughs> uh, because our tonal quality in our national politics right now is not very uplifting is it and we see so much bitterness and so much nastiness in our political debate that you really wonder where are the better angels that can surface within our political system and begin to establish some way as Americans that we can come together and do the business of a great country because arguably that fundamental premise is broken right now. We've got a Congress that is uh, very gridlocked and divided, uh, very often incapable of dealing with important questions that are on the national agenda and likely to remain so. I'm, I'm not going to lift much hope up today that things will change very soon with respect to the kind of gridlock and division that we have seen in our national politics. And it is troubling to me because as Laura was going through and I thought back to my own career here, I came to Washington, started working in the United States Senate in 1976. The issues on our national agenda there are fairly familiar. They were, you know, how do we protect the long-term social insurance programs like Medicare and Social Security so important to our elderly? At the time, we were talking about how do we create an educational system in our country that prepares people for co competition in a very fierce, competitive global economy. Remember Jimmy Carter around then established the Department of Education that was supposed to address that in some fashion. We had great debates about health care and how do we you know, ensure that Americans are going to have access to doctors and medicine and what can we do to make sure that we don't leave people without the care that they need. And we had lots of debates about the role the United States plays in the world. In a country that believes that there are fundamental human rights, how do you project our enormous strength in a military sense and then help lead the world? Well, does any of that sound vaguely familiar to you? I mean, the problem is that here we are, you know, a generation later, and so many of those same issues remain unsettled. And we are debating them still, and we'll likely debate them in the two years uh, coming forward with the new Congress taking office. So <clears throat> for me it's kind of you know not only Groundhog Day because we're talking about the same things over and over again but also a question we go in the future so the question before us today, I think, is, you know, it's framed in that, if you see that quote at the very top of the page, it's framed in the discussion that we are having in this series of Second Monday presentations about Matthew 25 and how we take care of the least, the last, and the lost. Um, because we are called as Christians to deal with the fact that so many in our society are not getting the kind of fundamental opportunity that is granted to many others in the majority culture. So how do we deal with that? How does this election impact that? And then the larger question is, is there a role for the church to play in this? And should the church play a role? So I really want to start there because I think that's a fundamental question. It's one 
that I get very often and it kind of comes in some fashion like, well, I'm not really sure that politics and religion ought to mix. I'm not really sure that the, because we have separation of church and state that this is something we should be talking about. But I think, you know, that's the point of this conversation today. We do need to talk about it and I'll argue, of course, that the church does have a very important role to play. But I want to start with, you know, we're good Wesleyans here at Wesley Theological Seminary. So I want to start exploring this just by using that quadrilateral that many of you are familiar with that John Wesley uh, brought into consideration of contentious issues, both theological and in many cases social and economic, because he was right at the forefront of talking and doing so much with respect to economic justice. And he starts fundamentally with scripture in the quadrilateral, moves to uh, what is the tradition of the church argue, well what does reason, because this was the age of enlightenment, you know, what is our own thinking and our own understanding bring to the equation, and then lastly what are our experiences. So each of those four I'll go through very quickly some things that I think set the table then for us to really look at the results in the 2014 election. I want to start with the scripture passages that are familiar and often quoted in this debate. Do religion and politics have anything to do with each other? And the first is the one that is familiarly quoted by those that say they really are separate and should be divided. It is, you know, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, render unto God the things that are God's. Now, the problem is, as it often is with scripture, is there's a lot of conflicting texts to look at. So look at the next one, which is you can't serve two masters. Uh, you know, you can only, you can't serve God and money, money being a surrogate there for what the temporal, the secular society brings. And so there's this tension that develops within our biblical tradition about how do, uh, how do people of belief and how do people of faith interact with those forms of government that are secular, that are established so that the civil society can govern itself. So then you have, you know, some texts that openly say, well, we've got to honor the emperor. And then I think, if you turn to page two at the top, the most uh, conflicting one, and the one that has probably bedeviled so much of human history, is Paul's letter to the Romans, in which he really lays out the case of what authority, where does authority come from? Well, all authority, and he's speaking here about authority in the civil sense of what is, you know, civil society organized to do, it comes only from God. And that everything that is instituted by God in terms of the leadership that we see in, in the world uh, is something that is divine. Well, we know where that went. It went to the concept of kings having a divine right to rule. It went to in some cases, enormous injustices done by secular authority in the name of something that was godly. And I think that's been a trouble in human history. And that is, you know, as we think ahead to our own founders, <coughs> something that caused them to rethink what the equation was between the creator God and the authority, the kingly world that uh, uh, presumably God had established. So. Jesus himself, in some of the things he says in scripture, suggests that there is no authority but God, but then in the interpretation that we see from the apostles and others, there is this accommodation that is made for what is happening in secular society. Because obviously not every, uh, not at the time that the early scriptures are written, not everything is instituted of God as Paul suggests. So we've got this tension in scripture that I think we have to wrestle with because people, as you know, when it comes to politics and religion, pull out Bibles and quote selectively whatever they want to quote to establish and justify whatever position they're taking. And I think we have to be broadly ecumenical as we read scripture and really think about the way in which particularly the early church struggled with what its relationship was going to be with secular authority. So that comes to the tradition of the church, and we know, you know, a lot about that. Um, the church, you know, persecuted in the first and second, second centuries, really, you know, finding itself, you know, under attack by the Roman Empire almost uh, daily, uh, finding its, you know, early church leaders martyred and sent off for, you know, gruesome deaths 
in a variety of settings. Not wanting to disrupt, <coughs> you know, not wanting to lose the momentum that the early church had in establishing a presence throughout the Mediterranean world, found itself wanting to, in some sense, accommodating the fact that there was a Roman Empire and that they had to deal within the confines of that empire. So we begin almost to see the church accommodating what secular authority is, is doing. And <coughs> you know, over time that became a, in some ways profitable engagement for the early church because eventually, of course, uh, Rome adopts Christianity as the religion of the empire. And then that provides an opportunity for a whole bunch of other things uh, to happen. And as you look at that history, and then look at the way in which theology has addressed that, this constant dialogue between what does the city of man look like, <coughs> thinking Augustinian here, versus the city of God and how are the two related, that is you know, a discussion and a debate that it kind of echoes throughout millennia of theological interpretation. So I've, you know, cited obviously Thomas Aquinas addresses this in a big way, but if you move all the way forward to the 20th, 21st century, our modern theologians have been dealing with exactly the same question, whether it's Bonhoeffer, or Niebuhr, even I'd argue Martin Luther King, it's about, you know, how does the faithful person, motivated by a true belief in Jesus Christ the Redeemer, act and interact with the world in which decisions are being made by a broader uh, and more diverse uh, civil society. And we, we see a lot of those debates played out throughout all of our history. And you know, to cite a few and how they you know, come together, the social gospel movement in the early 1900s is one. Uh, the debate that the founders had themselves about what is the role that God plays in this unique experiment that we are developing in what was the new America or in some cases even referred to by the Puritan divines as the New Jerusalem. You know, was there a special God-sanctioned blessing given to the way in which we would order the contemporary structure of how we would deal with things in our new emerging uh, American Republic? So I go through then to list, you know, what follows, and I'm not going to go read them all. But I think it's important to look at what some of the early founders of the American public really thought because we think of them as being as figures of the Enlightenment and uh, influenced very greatly by classical philosophy we think of them as being sort of apart from the church we think of the early experience in our American history as being a place that was in fact trying to separate itself from the religious dogmas of Europe because we wanted people to be able to come here and worship and believe freely without any kind of overlay of state sanction or state established uh, religion. But it's good to remember that all of those that we kind of count as our founders were themselves mostly deeply spiritual people who had deep uh, faith and deep belief. They were educated at places, you know, the early uh, universities that they attended, places like the College of New Jersey, now Princeton, my alma mater, and uh, Harvard, and places like that were what amounted to what we now think of as seminaries. So they were all seminary educated and very steeped in the tradition of biblical interpretation and understanding God's relationship to uh, the human uh, people. And that is, I think, understanding that and understanding their perspectives and seeing what some of them said even, you know, you'll see there Thomas Jefferson quoted, who we kind of always think of as being the one who cut out of his Bible. His holy Bible had a holy lot of holes in it because he would carve out those things that he thought represented Jesus the Christ as a divine being because he was not uh, enamored with that thought. But nonetheless, they all had some kind of deeply spiritual connection to the idea that God is sanctioning something in human behavior that's different. So if you think about the declaration itself, that you know it's a creator God that endows people with inalienable rights. It's not the state, it's not the kingdom that's established, it is something that is divine itself, that gives people the right to come together to order themselves 
to structure a government that then actually pursues the common good, life, liberty, and happiness for all the people. And I think seeing that that is kind of deep in the DNA of the American experience is something that really sets us in a better direction when we think about how do politics and religion interact today. So that's a, a context for where we are, and I'm not going to, I think those quotes are good to kind of keep in mind when someone says, well, look, our founders were, you know, deeply secular people who wanted to separate church and state and believe very strongly in that separation. You remind them that they were also deeply spiritual people. And as much as they were conscious of not wanting to have a state-established religion, they were nonetheless very confident that God was blessing this American experience with something divine. And that is who we are, is the American people. So then let's go on to experience as part of the quadrilateral. We've seen how this tension between the religious world and movements in our social history play out over time. I've listed a few there that are familiar to you. Uh, obviously, uh, abolition, prohibition, the social gospel movement that I mentioned already, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement. I've got sexual equality there, but that really is the debate about abortion and human sexuality broadly defined now, including a lot of debates about uh, uh, marriage equality and how that relates to uh, gender and how it relates to sexual preference. And all of that, I think, plays out in ways in which people are bringing their religious per perspective and faith perspective into arguing for some form of economic or social justice for those who have been either discriminated against or those who are subject to any kind of injustice that exists in our society. So we have, you know, throughout American history, <coughs> great examples of how religious people have come together, the faith traditions that we have, and more importantly, the established church itself playing a very direct role in these political movements that have had very enormous consequential social change in our society. So <coughs> mindful of that, we kind of then take a look at what you know, has been happening more recently. Now I'd say if you go back to the 1960s, this is the experience that many of us in the room remember well. In the 1960s, the progressive church especially had a very strong voice in the political movements of the day. Focused around obviously civil rights, but also around the other movements that were so important in shaping you know, our social change in the 1960s. They were there and present in the feminist movement. They were there certainly as part of the anti-war movement, which was very much a church-based <coughs> movement. Uh, they were there, you know, Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail, remember, was written to who? Was written to white pastors who were sitting on the sidelines of this very enormously important uh, social movement that was arguing for justice. And he said, you can't be on the sidelines if you were a person of faith. And that document is really a theological justification for why people of faith and belief need to be actively involved in pursuing political change. You fast forward to that, it kind of maybe even a kind of reaction to some of the 1960s. In the 1970s, we see the rise of a conservative evangelical voice that said, actually, in fact, you know, if you're drawn by belief to, to saying that you need to be participant in the political movements of the day. Well, there is an argument that says a conservative approach, uh, one that is kind of more fundamental, fundamentalist and more evangelical is the correct place. And we end up with things like moral majority. We end up with uh, the conservative social movements of the 1980s and 90s that gave rise to a real shift in the political pendulum in our country. So there was the church then, you know, the church as not a universal church, but as a defined church really shaping more of a conservative agenda becomes fused in with what a lot of conservatives then advocated as policies in the era of Ronald Reagan and others. And that, you know, troubles perhaps many of the liberals who had been participating in the social changes of the 1960s, and they suddenly said, well, gee, the church that I am seeing playing out in the public square is leaving me behind because they're moving in this more right-wing direction. And that created, I think, part of the political tension that exists. By the way, this, this gridlock, this bitterness, this division in our political culture today does have a theological tension attributed to it. Because it is, we see social conservatives who come from evangelical backgrounds battling it out very often with people who are more liberal, progressive, 
and you know, predominantly in the mainline Protestant church and to a degree the Catholic church. So those tensions are still there and still playing out. All right, well let's <coughs> very quickly look at what's the public think of all of this. I mean, when you ask the general public, not just people gather a Monday morning at Wesley Seminary, what do you think about this connection between politics and religion? You get kind of a pretty divided response. On the one hand, you know, most people say that they think religion should have influence in public life. You know, we see here 72% saying that, and that number is actually growing from the recent elections in 2012, 2010. And they believe it's not a good thing if religion and the influence of religion begins to subside in our political culture. They want to see more uh, faithful belief and dialogue played on what they see elected people doing once they come into office. At the same, and so at the same time you see, you know, 49% saying churches of, and houses of worship should express their views on social and economic justice issues. And that number is up, but 48% are still a little bit ambivalent and skeptical about that, but the, but the numbers are moving in the direction of those that believe given how poisoned the political atmosphere is today that the church needs to step in and start taking a role. So we're seeing an increase in the numbers that are arguing, saying that there should be uh, some kind of direct role that religion and the faith will play in our politics. Now that's not to say that they want churches to endorse candidates or take a more direct active role in politics. They don't want preachers in pulpits endorsing specific candidates and saying God wants you to vote for this Democrat or this Republican. Uh, that happens in a lot of churches. It happens in particular in the African American church in which there is a voice in the pulpit that is more often directly political. That's part of a culture and a tradition that's been around for a long time. But on the, in the main, people are a little leery about seeing churches directly involved and of course for good reason tax law uh, exempts churches from certain kinds of taxation but with the specific proviso that they not be involved in direct political activity. So we see and have seen in recent years the IRS playing a role in kind of calibrating how much churches can actually be involved directly in politics. It's something we might want to explore a little bit in questions later. But the larger picture is, <clears throat> you know, in general, as a culture, organized religion is in decline. And among young people who are asked, who do you affiliate with? The answer is, more often than not, none, not N-U-N, N-O-N-E, that they're not seeing themselves uh, as they think of their own belief and their own spirituality as connected into organized religion. And that, you know, sets up an issue about how effective churches and organized religion would be if they were more directly involved in politics. I mean, what would it take for them if they were going to do something the American people seem to favor, which is to speak out and be more active in movements that aim at economic and social justice? How would they do that if, in fact, in membership and in participation in worship, the church itself is in decline. The answer may be, if you look at young people, that there are brand new different ways for them to experience and project their spirituality. And it may not necessarily be in pews surrounded by stained glass, it may be in what is emerging as a different and new kind of church. Something that we look at and talk about often here at Wesley Seminary. Okay, that's <coughs> that was a big build up to what probably many of you wanted to hear more about, which is what just happened in this election. And good gracious, where were the Democrats? And you know, what, are we, what did we end up with here? So I've got some numbers here. Most of this comes from, we rely a lot on exit polling. Exit polling is not an exact science, but it has increasingly become a pretty good barometer. When pollsters connect with people after they have voted, at that moment when they're willing to maybe talk and reflect about the decisions they've just made, we get some pretty good and generally reliable data about what was on the mind of the voter and the electorate as they participated in a national election. So here are numbers that come right out of the exit polls that were just done last Tuesday. Obviously, I mean, the story of the election was 
if you're in a red state, Republicans had a pretty easy time of winning. And that had a lot to do with why the Senate uh, changed control, because the Republicans won red states. And as you see, they constituted about 35% of the vote, independents being 28% and Democrats 35%. That is roughly the split. It's been, you know, more or less in the neighborhood of a third, a third, a third in most of our recent elections. So that as the Democrats and the Republicans become more strident on the edges of the political spectrum, the battle is very often in between for the independents, who are not truly independent because in each election they either tip one way or the other. And the independents obviously in this election uh, tipped Republican and that had as a consequence the election results that I think we saw play out <coughs> around the country. And a couple of other things that are important, but well, what happened to the Democrats, you know, where were they? Well, the answer, part of it is younger people, 18 to 29, know that it's important to vote in presidential elections, but they are a little less inclined to say it's important to vote in midterms. So the turnout for the younger voters was down, and in the next uh, age bracket up, the 20 to 44-year-old category, it was down. And those two categories have been in most of our recent elections much more majority Democratic leaning in their voting. As you get up older and older, the, the balance begins to tip more to the Republicans. And in fact, in the 2012 election, that the most reliable voters who, uh, you know, elected, who voted for the Republican candidate over President Obama were 65 plus, because that was the only age group that gave a majority of the vote to, uh, to John McCain. So, as you think about the composition of the electorate, I have, have here that it's, it's older, whiter, richer, more conservative, and more evangelical. And that kind of plays out as you look at all the different categories there. <coughs> Democrats were, you know, held their own and got a majority in the under $50,000 annual income category, but everybody who made more than $50,000 were more likely to vote Republican than Democratic. The impact of those who self-describe themselves as evangelical and born again uh, plays out as it has in most recent elections. It is overwhelmingly Republican. Uh, another measure of that, the exit poll asks is, do you attend church weekly? And you see there that that's a, a disproportionate Republican number as well. This sets up what is sometimes referred to as the red God, blue God debate. Um, is there a red God, is there a blue God, and you know, is God a Republican or a Democrat or, or what? And there are some that, you know, try to answer affirmatively a question that is obviously unanswerable. But uh, I, I do think that in the long term, the sense that, gee, if you're a religious person and one of those Jesus people, you're probably a Republican, that has infected a lot of folks that I know who are operatives in the Democratic political world because they tend not to understand that outreach to the faith community is something that would be in their interest because they're in fact a widely diverse set of voters who are themselves you know, deeply faithful and spiritual who happen to be also progressive and liberal. But that tends to get ignored and under misunderstood uh, by in the ranks of the democratic political operatives. They have, as I mentioned earlier, more or less think of outreach to the religious world as being let's go to some black churches on the Sunday before the election and try to prove that we can sway in time to music and do call and response, usually not very effective. If you remember Al Gore trying to do that. Um, and it, you know, the opportunity to really get a broader definition of what a, a real agenda of social and economic justice might look like from a liberal faith perspective gets discounted. I think that's something Democrats, if they want to be successful looking ahead in 2016 and beyond, they're going to have to contend with that. Okay, so a little bit about, you know, what's the landscape as we now want to shift to? What does this really, in fact, mean for the least, the last, and the lost? Well, first of all, people are not very happy about the condition of the economy. Um, even though economic indicators, all the job statistics, economic growth were improving over the course of the summer and into the fall, there is, by general understanding, about a three to four month lag time between an improvement in economic statistics and when the American people really feel it. 
So the bad news for Democrats and for President Obama is that whatever improvements we're seeing in the economy, however fragile the economic recovery has been, it didn't impact the thinking of the voter enough to make them think that things are getting better. So you get this classic measure the pollsters use in politics. Do you, in general, do you think the country is on the right, is going the right direction, or is it in the, going off in the wrong track? And the right track, wrong track number there, as you can see, is pretty dismal for the incumbent Democrats, only 31% saying that we're on the right track and 65% saying we're going the wrong direction. So that's right there, uh, a number that would suggest that you are gonna see some reaction against uh, incumbent Democrats or incumbent parties and more of an opportunity for people who are challenging and coming uh, from outside the establishment and looking to sort of say, I'm going to Washington to shake things up and change it. Um, again, a measure there on the next page, you know, are you worried about the economy? Well, obviously 79% saying that they're either worried, very worried or worried means that there's a lot of economic anxiety bubbling throughout the electorate and they are going to hold someone responsible for that uh, perspective and obviously the person that they held responsible in some ways was the president because in, in some cases they thought they were sending at least some kind of message to President Obama about the desire for change. Some rankings there about the issues most important to the voters as they voted on Tuesday, and obviously the economy is at the top of the list. And then health care can kind of go either way. And some people are listed health care because they think Obamacare is bad and it needs to be fixed. Others probably listed health care because they still don't have any confidence uh, that the kind of arrangements they need so that they have access to doctors and medicine are presenting themselves. Uh, interesting number, does the U.S. economy favor the wealthy or is it fair to most Americans? Well, obviously people believe that our current system is skewed towards the interests of the very wealthy and not the interests of the least and the last and the lost. So that is, you know, going to be, I think, an echo you're going to see in politics as we go forward over the next two years. But then this last number, which I think is the most important one, is <coughs> Should government do more to help people in need? Well, in this election, only 41% yet said yes, and they were obviously, most of them, Democratic voters. But 54%, oh, so a clear majority, said uh, no, that the government should not do more to help those in need. And they were obviously the Republican voters that constituted the majority in the election. So the tension here, where do we look for policies that will help people who are truly suffering in this country, either through joblessness, homelessness, lack of economic opportunity, or outright sheer discrimination. The culture right now is not suggesting that a government response is the first place to look. They are obviously looking for some other mixture of responses because they know there's a need there. Nobody disputes the idea that we should take care of those in need. The question is who does it? And the reaction against government being the focus of the response is something that clearly comes through in this data from the election. And I think that has some implications for how we organize ourselves to discuss public policy, uh, discuss legislation that might come before the Congress, and then what the response of the church should be if it's going to be able to fill part of that gap and address the needs of people who are suffering. Because it does really clearly imply that people are looking to non-governmental entities as part of the answer. And that obviously, first and foremost, as we think about our own calling in Matthew 25, it calls to question what is the church's role in these debates. So, um, you know, what are the prospects? I'm going to skip over this because we, you might want to ask specific questions about some of this. The Republican Party is fractured. They've got a Tea Party element that really reflects this anti-government sentiment in a very big way. And now they've got the responsibility of trying to organize themselves, come together, come around an agenda. And they've been so far in the days since the election a little bit circumspect about how they uh -huh. define that agenda. Unless you consider building the Keystone Pipeline from Canada and patent reform as being the two most urgent issues of the day. That's the one thing that all Republicans seem to agree that they should probably tackle. But on the larger issues like how do we structure the federal budget? What should we do about immigration reform? Should there be a path towards citizenship for those who've been in the country and 
working hard and being a part of the American committee on those issues, Republicans are going to be divided and probably it'll take some time for them to come to some consensus within their party. Um, on the question of whether your voters prefer those candidates who are willing to compromise versus sticking to their principles, an interesting thing happened in this election. In the past several elections, voters have generally said, I prefer candidates who will stick to their principles and fight for what they believe. But I think they now understand intuitively that that leads to more gridlock and no progress. So the number flipped in this election, and people who now want to see compromise came out ahead of those who want to uh, people want uh, leaders who are sticking to whatever their rigid uh, political orthodoxy is required of them. So that maybe is a sign for help. But there's a very, very large agenda of unsettled business there, and I just should give you some idea of when these things are going to hit. We're going to have a budget uh, that expires December 11th, and not clear how we're going to continue. Any, anything beyond another kick the can down the road continuing resolution that lets us play this debate out over the budget sometime next year. Uh, there are Medicare cuts, they are structured in law, part of it under the Affordable Care Act that kick in and there has to be some accounting for how we are going to deal with that. A thing called the Doc Fix which Congress has to uh, struggle with just about every time they get into a continuing resolution debate that's going to come up again and then looming next summer is the question whether you lift the ceiling on the federal debt and that could be I think a trigger if by then we haven't seen things coalesce and new progress being made that could be the fight that puts us back in a question of whether or not we're going to default on the uh, good faith of the American government and then perhaps even shut the government down again. Okay so the role of the church and then I'm going to wind up and leave us a few minutes for questioning. Um, <coughs> There's a thing called public theology. I don't particularly like the term, but since I'm now a distinguished professor of public theology, I better get, I better warm to it a little bit. Um, by the way, distinguished professor, if you wonder about that, that's a, that's a, there's, there are two good things about being a distinguished professor. One, the rest of the faculty doesn't hold it against you because you're outside tenure considerations, so you don't screw up any of their politics. And the second is, you don't have to use the fancy screens here, you can still have a paper handout. <laughs> so, do it the old-fashioned way. Um, <clears throat> but I, uh, I like to say, bar barring a phrase from one of my faculty colleagues, Sothi Clark, that the role the church has to play here at a place like, well, the, the role that public theology needs to play at a place like Wesley C Seminary is to be simultaneously passionately Christian but compassionately diverse in the way in which we think of how faith informs public policy. He, he talks a lot about that in terms of global policies and he's got a, one of these new massive open online courses, a MOOC that is titled exactly that, uh, uh, Passionately Christian and Compassionately Interfaith. But I think that really has to be the way we approach this subject because we draw on a very distinct Christian perspective on these things influenced by millennia of Christian theology. But we have to be accommodating and conscious of the diversity that is represented in this country now. Not only from those who have other faiths that, ref that reflect how they would bring a perspective to the public debate because there's a very large uh, Jewish and Hebrew tradition around these issues. Obviously there's very important understanding of how Islam uh, impacts these equations. And we need to factor all of that in, but we will be looking at it from and teaching about it from a distinctly uh, Christian perspective. We um, are, I think, and I believe, need to incline to something that I call golden rule politics. That if we are called to love God with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind, but equally important to love neighbor as thyself, then there needs to be a little more love for the other in our political discourse. One of the things I talk about when I meet with my friends who are still in the political world, and as Laura mentioned, I, I co-chair the Commission on Presidential Debates, so I have some authority to say to candidates, particularly those running for president, that we're going to have a debate, and it ought to be one that really reflects respect and integrity for the other point of view and people are looking for exactly that kind of authentic dialogue and not the kind of thing that we've seen 
splattered across television in so many of the 30-second commercials that candidates put on the air, which is not a very loving approach to how you create political dialogue. So I think we can play some role in suggesting that there is a better and alternative voice that could be used and a different kind of vocabulary that can be used in our political debates. And that's something I think we want to encourage here. And I think Matthew 25 is a pretty good place to begin to structure that kind of dialogue because we can actually talk about getting candidates off of their incessant uh, belief that it's only the middle class that needs to be addressed in these national elections, that in fact there needs to be a more broad view of how we take care of all of those who may be trapped by some kind of social or economic injustice in our country, and that people will be responsive to a call for a common good that lifts everybody up. Two interesting things, and then I'll I'll quit. First is, someone's going to ask me whether Mrs. Clinton's running for president. And I'll preempt that question by saying I have no earthly idea. And more importantly, I'm the last person in town that believes that maybe she doesn't know herself yet. And she's still pondering it. But one of the things I've heard her talk about and looked at, and I was asked to comment on some of her uh, stump speeches during the recent election, and she's playing very much with this idea that we need to reinvigorate the American dream. I didn't put it in here, but one of the more other more telling pieces of public opinion research is we now are in the first time where over two-thirds of this country does not believe that if you work hard, play by the rules, you'll be able to pass on a quality of life better for your kids than the quality of life you enjoy today. That is the essence of what has been always called the American dream, and it is not part of our consciousness right now. It is actually, in a despairing way, something that people doubt is true about America today. And I see Mrs. Clinton and a lot of what she's talking about saying, well, we can't allow that to happen. We've got to get back to a place where people really do believe that they can get ahead if they work hard and if they participate in society together and lift up a common good. So I think that'll, we'll see some of those themes play out in the election ahead. And then the second thing I'll I want to lift up is a really interesting idea, and it comes to me from a woman named Claire Gaudiani, who's the former president of uh, Connecticut College and a member of the Henry Luce Foundation Board, which you will understand in a minute, and uh, is very, very important to me. And I've been collaborating with her on an idea she has that she calls the Declaration Initiative. And the idea is a simple thing. It is to celebrate in the year 2026, the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence by having, by that date, created a, a, an array of economic uh, and social policies that do ensure that every child in America has an opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a big idea, but it translates into very specific policy changes, ways in which we address uh, everything from food stamps to education policy to pre-K, kindergarten, to brain development, to a whole bunch of things that would ensure that young people, particularly children, have the kind of opportunity that those founders wrote about so long ago. Now that is a long-term objective. 2026 would be at the end of whichever president we elect in 2016, assuming he or she serves two terms, 2026 would be midway through the president beyond that. So it's a long-term objective, but I think it's an achievable one, and it is the kind of aspirational, visional, visionary objective that I think we need more of in politics today, and the kind of thing that we will be promoting here at Wesley Theological Seminary, where, to conclude my remark, we have been planning a new Center for Public Theology to deal with exactly the kinds of questions I've been talking about this morning. We were delighted uh, last year to get a $100,000 grant from the Arthur Finding Davis Foundation to allow the planning and the work to structure this center uh, to take place. And I am happy to announce this morning, to end my little talk, that late last week we learned from the Henry Luce Foundation that we've just been given a $600,000 three-year grant to really make this thing real with yours truly as the presumed director of that center. So I'm going to be at this for a long time, 
and I talked too long this morning, but I think it's an opportunity now for you to quiz me and have equal time. Thank you very, very much. advantage of David McAllister Wilson not being here this morning is that he doesn't get to lob the first difficult question, but instead you all do. I'm going to ask that you um, help us out here. At Wesley we talk a lot about people learning to use their preacher voice, and while we um, aren't live right now, we are videotaping, and so to be able to catch questions, you're going to need to use your best preacher voice, and Mike, you're going to need to restate the question as best you can. I will. So, does anyone have any questions for Mike this morning? I do. I've got a preacher voice because I used to be one. All right. All right. Go ahead. Thank you for your talk, particularly the preparation. That is very helpful. Here's my problem. Last year <coughs> I turned 80, I've been following politics and Jack Kennedy in the early 60s. And here's what I believe. I believe it's not in blue states and red states and all that stuff. It's somewhere between, depending on who you read, 40 and 400 excessively wealthy, powerful human beings that run the whole shebang <laughs> in the world, including the government of the United States. I am I'm more tormented by this than I can tell you. Where do you agree and where do you disagree? All right, the, the question, to, to restate it, uh, although it was much more passionate than that, is, is there a disparity in which power is used in our society because it's used towards those who are the wealthiest. Um, Oxfam produced a report yesterday which is interesting and would might even corroborate some of that, that the 85 richest people in the world have more money than the 3.5 billion poorest. And they do have enormous power, but that power is not reflected in political outcomes, I believe. So I would take some issue with your premise. Uh, I believe, I see everyone, I, I, full disclosure, I do some work for Bill Gates and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's used his wealth in an enormously successful way to address diseases of poverty in uh, Africa to uh, help think through what we can do to make education in this country a better quality experience for people and deal with some of the <coughs> dysfunctionality that exists in our system of public education. To my knowledge, aside from his own personal contributions, he's not used his great wealth in that foundation to play any direct role in politics or to try to, you know, adjust the outcome of government with the exception of policies that would promote development assistance and taking care of the least last and the lost in a lot of places. That's one example. There are other examples where people have played a more direct role. But look, we get into this debate a lot when it comes to politics. Oh, my goodness, the special interests have all the money and that they screw up our political system. Well, this entire campaign that we've just had cost about $3.7 billion. That's a lot of money. On Halloween, Americans spent $7.3 billion just for trick-or-treating and costumes almost twice as much as we spent on the campaign. And if you look across a lot of other broad measures, what we spend on video games, what we spend on entertainment, what we spend on other things, probably are more dominant in how our culture shapes the thinking of many Americans than what the, the, the fractional amount that we actually spend for candidates to get their ideas out there. And, you know, look, the easiest way to conclude that the wealthiest don't have a you know stranglehold on the outcomes of government is to see how largely in unsuccessful uh, the most moneyed interests have been in producing policies that would other otherwise be in their self-interest. I mean, whether it's tax reform, you know how long the corporate world has been arguing that we need to reform the corporate tax code. I mean, that will be continue to be a debate, but it hasn't gotten done because they lack, I think, the ability to have any direct outcome that's in there their special interest. So I'm, I, I, you know, I'm conscious that they get access and that they get a voice that they wouldn't otherwise heard, but they don't dictate the outcome. And I, I hope that gives you a little more hope than you might otherwise have at age 80. 80 is the new 60, and I'm 60, just turned 60, and that's the new 40. So, <laughs> yes. Okay, given that, um, what do you see 
can happen in the next two years to improve the, the situation of the least and the lost and the last. Take maybe one issue, the immigrants that are coming in. Are there children all over the place in some of our communities that came by themselves and they're in the schools and the schools are struggling uh, mightily to, to be able to help them to adjust and be able to graduate. The prospects for the least, last, and lost, particularly those young immigrants we saw play out during this campaign, so many of the young children who were along the uh, Texas-Mexican border uh, who were clearly suffering, and the lack of a, a generous response in many places of America to their condition maybe was something that a little troubling to, to many people and probably to you. Um, what will happen in the next two years that will in, impact that equation? Well, well I alluded to it uh, in, obliquely. The economy is improving, and people's willingness to share and to sacrifice for a common good when they feel like things are getting better economically for them and for their families, that tends to be a time of greater generosity. Now that my president that I served, Bill Clinton, benefited from that in the 1990s. People felt there was a robust economy, job opportunities were growing leaps and bounds, and people generally were a little more willing to accommodate policies that would address the needs of those who were poor. But I see a couple of things that, are, that give me hope. Now, you wouldn't expect a loyal, true blue Democrat to cite Representative Paul Ryan the most recent Republican vice presidential candidate. But Paul Ryan put together a pretty thoughtful um, proposal on how programs for the poor could be restructured, and he conditioned it on saying, this is not a surreptitious plan to cut funding for those programs. It is a <clears throat> proposal to change the way in which government interacts with those who are in need. But we've got to do something to address the needs of the poor. and I. It was the first time in my recent memory that a conservative Republican had come along and talked about the need for there to be both government and private sector policies that would specifically address the condition that the poor have in this country. I think that's very, very important. I didn't cite this in the exit poll data, but Republicans made some progress in reaching Latino voters in this most recent election, and they know long term there is no prospect for them winning an electoral college majority in national campaigns for the presidency unless they can claim a greater share of the Hispanic vote. And that would seem to me, as a matter of common sense, to argue for uh, a, a different approach on immigration than they showed in the last two years. So I am hopeful that we might actually see real reform in immigration. You know, it, it, the, the problem is, as the president said the other day, He's willing to draw a line in the sand on that through using executive authority, and the Republicans have already said that's like waving a red uh, blanket in front of a bull. Don't do that. But somewhere in between there, given the political interests that both parties have in creating a better response within the Latino vote, I think they will get that done. And that will vastly improve the condition of a lot of those children who are here and who have got no prospect unless they've got some pathway to, towards citizenship. I guess I can take maybe one, two more? Okay. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that government, I didn't even read the last sorry. Government should not be the first response to answer the question. Uh, people are looking more to non governmental organizations. But if there if what's the level of engagement? Um, are non governmental organizations are people becoming more engaged? And if people are looking to non-governmental organizations, yet the engagement is followed, what does that say? Yeah, a good question. The question is really about the role government plays versus non-governmental entities in addressing some of the needs of the poor. And as I showed in my uh, outline there, there's some skepticism that government should be the answer. Most people believe it may be part of an answer. I guess that's the answer to your question. They, the, the, the issue is they don't believe government can step in and solve every single problem because they think there has to be some response from private entities, non-governmental organizations, and, and frankly from individuals themselves taking more responsibility. And that, by the way, was part of the equation. If you remember Bill Clinton, and I think you'll hear an echo of that from Mrs. Clinton, 
he was always about it has to be opportunity but responsibility. The government can help provide opportunity for those who are in need uh, and who need a helping hand, but people have to be responsible and take, uh, you know, take uh, control of their own situations and work uh, to improve their lives by, he would usually say, working hard, playing by the rules, being part of a community that is really helping to lift all people up. And that seems to be where people come out. And by the way, the interesting thing for me is that a lot of the rigid ideologies that you associate with we who are baby boomers, who have been, I think, largely responsible for a lot of this frozen tundra in our political system because of our rigid ideologies, you see none of that among young people who are much more flexible and pragmatic when it comes to what works. And they are the ones that are, you know, deeply involved in volunteering. They want to be community oriented in their participation. And when I say to them, I said, you know, you understand, that's fundamentally political because you're working for change. They said, no, it's not politics. You know, I'm not into politics. So they see a disconnect there. But they are very much a part of giving the kind of response that I think is going to lead to more generous outcomes. Maybe that's the hopeful way in which we, we say we're going to exit stage right as baby boomers and let the young people come and take over and run things. Maybe they'll do a lot better job than we do. Maybe that's not a bad idea. Thank you all very, very much. We seek here to feed you in a couple different ways at these second Mondays. We feed you body, mind, and spirit, we hope. And in this time, you get a little taste of what it is that people who are preparing for leadership and ministry get in the classroom every day here at the seminary. Please, please, please consider bringing someone you know to one of our upcoming events. There's a flyer out in the um, out of the table that you can pick up that gives the rest of the schedule. We're joined next month on Monday, December 8th by Kendall Solon, who is a professor of systematic theology, and will address this same topic of what what hap what is it about the least and the last and the lost? How do we how how are we caring in that space? So we hope you'll join us and thank you so much for being here today. A, a little hint: systematics was the hardest <laughs> course that I took <laughs> getting my degree, but Kendall was absolutely spectacular in sorting it all out. These are the big fundamental questions of how we structure our Christian uh, belief in a big systematic way, and I think you'll en enjoy it. He makes it much more accessible than a lot of other theologians who address that topic. Thank you so much. Thank you.